Uh, good morning, colleagues. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning from across the province. I see names from almost all the corners of this province, and we're very excited that you have joined the PCM team that is going to be presenting a case for us. Uh, after the case, we'll have discussions. Feel free to ask any questions or to make any comments. No one is right, no one is wrong, as long as the answer comes from the guidelines and not from what we think. And for the purposes of these meetings, we are going to use the Department of Health guidelines. We know that there are quite a number of other guidelines out there that may contradict, but where there is a contradiction, the Department of Health guidelines takes precedence. Uh, thank you very much, Madeline and team, for preparing the presentation for us. This is the first time that we are joining you. We are hoping to have more of these meetings every Friday from 8 to 9. Uh, thank you very much. Over. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Dr. Jack, for getting this all up and going again. We're very excited. We've been missing our, our Friday morning meetings from, from before, the, before the COVID era. Uh, we would just like to welcome everybody here to the Family Medicine Boardroom. This is Dr. Madeleine Muller speaking. I'm one of the family physicians here. We have uh, regular CPD meetings every morning. And once a month, we always have uh, HIV case discussion. So just to put a little bit in context, so the CMH Family Medicine Department has a wellness center um, where we see quite complicated um, HIV and ARV cases. So our clinics manage our basic a HIV program, but when there are complications on the ARVs or when they need third line, for example, then they come to us. So we will be doing looking specifically at complicated cases within adult care. Uh, we have Dr. Lemley is our intern here today, is going to be doing the presentation. Um, and we are very grateful. She's done a lot of work in, in, in preparing this presentation for us. Um, just please note that we would like to, we, there has been a, they have applied for CPD accreditation for the session. And for that, you therefore need to fill in the attendance register. So you will notice in the chat, I've added a Google form link. Please fill in your details in that attendance register. If you're having a problem for um, technical reasons to fill in the Google form, you can also put your details in the chat. I will need your name and most importantly, your email address and your MP number or your SANAC number to be able to put those on the certificate. So please do that for us if you're struggling with the Google form. And then you can fill that in any time during the next hour. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Lenby. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not sure, can you, can everyone hear me? Is that okay? All right. Um, my name is Taylor, one of the interns um, rotating through family medicine, um, as Dr. Muller already mentioned. Um, and today we're gonna to be addressing Kaposi sarcoma um, with an emphasis of Kaposi sarcoma within the South African healthcare setting. Um, excuse me, thank you. Um, so this is just a brief overview of the, the content of the presentation to follow. Um, we're going to um, begin with a case presentation and then cover various aspects um, of Kaposi sarcoma um, thereafter. Not very good at the Zoom share thing. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to begin with the, the case presentation um, related to Mrs. T. N. So I'm just going to provide some background history. She's a 43-year-old widow um, employed as a domestic worker who lives in Enoch Mejima municipality with her two children, aged 14 and 16 years, who are currently attending high school. She was referred to our CMH dermatology clinic um, by Hewu Hospital on account of purple skin lesions affecting the entire body. On the day um, that she arrived for an appointment at CMH, Mrs. TN had a positive screening tool for COVID-19. She had a cough, shortness of breath, and tachycardia, and was transferred to the PUI section um, of casualty for further workup after consultation with the physician on call at Cecilia Makiwane. Um, with regards to her past medical history, um, Mrs. TN was diagnosed HIV positive in 2017. She was commenced on TE in 2017 and is, encouraged, is currently still on the same regimen. She doesn't report any previous um, TPT. She was previously on Bactrim, but not at present. Um, she also has a previous history of pulmonary TB, um, first diagnosed in 2015, for which she completed six months of treatment. In December 2021, um, she was diagnosed with pulmonary TB once again, 
um, on the basis of chest X-ray findings. She's currently on month three um, of continuation phase of therapy um, with a poor response to treatment um, so far. With regards to other aspects of her medical history, um, she doesn't have any other known medical comorbidities, no previous surgery, no known allergies, um, and no recreational substance use with an occasional ethanol cons consumption reported. With regards to her gynecological and obstetric history, G3, P2, with one previous termination of pregnancy. She doesn't report any previous pap smear. Um, she's currently involved in a sexual relationship with her boyfriend, who is a 50-year-old taxi driver. His status is unknown, and she has not yet disclosed her status to him. She also admits to inconsistent um, condom use. Thank you. Then on further examination um, of Mrs. PN in the PUI section of casualty, her vitals were um, as followed. So it's tachycardic uh, with a heart rate of 130, um, tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 26, the SATs were 93% on room air, and she was noted to have a temperature of 38.1. Um, we did some bedside investigations, um, and she was noted to have a ward HB of 8.9, and a random blood glucose of 5.5. Um, on general examination, she's pale. Um, her skin reveals extensive purple nodules, um, um, including the oral mucosa. Um, and on respiratory examination, she um, had reduced air entry bilaterally, with um, crepitant, um, crepitations at the lung bases bilaterally. Um, These are just some pictures um, on further examination of Mrs. TN's skin. And you can see quite extensive lesions um, on the face, including the nose and in the oral cavity itself. Um, and these are just some of the lesions, um, including her upper limbs and her lower limbs. Furthermore, um, we did a chest x-ray um, for Mrs. TN in casualty, um, and this is, a, this, is, this is what we found. Um, and you can see there's some evidence of hyperinflation with bilateral opacities. There are also some areas of breakdown um, and cavitation bilaterally. Um, and then you can see um, a reticular pattern um, of opacification uh, donate, donated by the, the star, with some areas of nodularity um, donated by the arrow on the left. Um, there's no obvious disruption of the paratracheal line, which might suggest mediastinal lymphadenopathy in this um, image. This is a summary of the results of the investigation performed um, for Mrs. TN, um, dating back to 2017 on her initial um, diagnosis um, of HIV infection. Um, you can see initially um, she was virally suppressed um, on her TEE. And then for quite an extended period of time, um, her, her viral load has been uncontrolled. Um, when she presented um, in December, um, at, that, at that point, her CD4 count was already very low, it was 22, um, with a viral load of more than 450,000. Um, a gene expert um, was um, collected at that point, it was negative, and the PCR was also negative. Um, but she was, you know, began on TB treatment um, based on the, the chest x-ray findings, as reported earlier. And then on our presentation to Makiwane, um, further bloods were taken, um, which revealed worsening of, um, you know, her biological failure um, and advanced RBD disease of the CD4 of 8. Um, once again, um, her COVID PCR was negative. Um, oh, thank you so much. All right, and then just um, thank you for bearing with me through just navigating the Zoom presentation. I'm just gonna move on to um, some more details about Kaposi sarcoma. So Kaposi sarcoma is a low grade andro-proliferative um, disorder associated with infection with human herpes virus eight, which is also referred to as the Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. Um, <coughs> human herpes virus eight um, is an oncogenic um, virus belonging to the herpes viridae family um, found in all lesions um, of all epidemiological forms of Kaposi sarcoma. Um, and it is implicated um, in the development of Kaposi sarcoma lesions through encoding various oncogenic proteins that um, modulate um, cellular pathways and can lead to the inhibition of apoptosis, um, cell proliferation, angiogenesis, inflammation, and immune escape. Four epidemiological forms of Kaposi sarcoma exist and have been described. Um, these include uh, the classic, which is a more indolent cutaneous proliferative disease, which affects older males, typically of Mediterranean and Jewish descent. We also um, see an endemic or African form of Kaposi sarcoma, which is described 
in Sub-Saharan Africa prior to the HIV AIDS epidemic um, with marked increases in the incidence of Kaposi sarcoma in these regions um, following the onset of the HIV epidemic. Um, Organ transplant, um, transplant associated Kaposi sarcoma is not so common in our setting, but it is related to immunosuppressive therapy following um, solid organ transplantation. And then um, the one I think that we're most familiar with and the one that this presentation is going to focus on is the HIV AIDS related epidemic um, Kaposi sarcoma. Um, and uh, the, the reason that I'm gonna focus on today is because it is a very common malignancy diagnosed in HIV positive um, individuals. The risk of Kaposi sarcoma is increased by immunodeficiency that is induced by HIV infection. Um, and actually more than 90% of known cases identified are in patients who are infected with HIV infection. Um, and patients with HIV infection are actually at a 30 to 50% higher risk of Kaposi sarcoma um, versus those who are not um, HIV infected. Um, so just with regards to the pathogenesis, um, I wouldn't get too worried about everything that's going on the slide, quite complex. I haven't gone into um, the specific interleukins or cellular pathways, um, but just briefly um, about the pathogenesis of Kaposi sarcoma. Um, as I said earlier, it's an angioproliferative disease with a viral etiology um, and a multifactorial um, pathogenesis hinged on immune dysregulation and dysfunction. Um, there are various mechanisms by which the human herpes virus 8 um, actually transforms endothelial um, cells and results in um, the formation of these neoplastic spindle cell components of the Kaposi sarcoma lesions. So various viral gene products um, of human herpes virus 8 affect the cell cycle um, and the control of um, apoptosis and regulation of the cycle. Um, segments of the HHHV8 genome comprise of oncogenes um, that play a role in tumor formation. Uh, various viral genes are expressed during latency, and these facilitate um, viral replication within the host cell, and these are typically endothelial cells or B cells, um, while disrupting the function of tumor suppressor genes um, and avoiding recognition of these pathogens by the host immune system. Um, various viral, um, viral genes are expressed during the lytic um, phase of the cycle, and these play a role um, in increased expression of growth factors such as um, VEGF um, and our tyrosine kinase receptors, amongst many others, um, which stimulate angiogenesis um, and activate growth regulatory pathways um, with resultant dysregulated cell growth. Mm. Um, and then just, just to note, it is, it's, it's thought that induction of the HH um, the atelitic cycle is possibly influenced by many factors, and one of these um, include HIV-associated um, inflammatory cytokines. Then just with regards to the epidemiology um, of Kaposi sarcoma, I have um, based um, the, the content of this slide on the results of a retrospective cross-sectional cross study design um, that reviewed 901 patients um, diagnosed with Kaposi sarcoma at Chris Harney Baragwan Academic Hospital between the years of 2015 and 2009. My apologies, I see that my thing order corrected Chris Harney to, to hand. Um, and the, the reason for selecting the study is that it was it's local to our setting, um, and there aren't there isn't really many other studies that focus on epidemiology within a South African setting, um, but I have found that these findings do correlate with the, the general epidemiology of um, Kaposi sarcoma. And so some of the findings of the study um, revealed that Kaposi sarcoma is more frequent in males with a male-female ratio of about 1.2 to one. Um, in the study, 81.1% of the participants were noted to be HIV positive um, with an unknown HIV status in about 18% of those cases, which again, just shows the high um, proportion of um, HIV positive patients who present with Kaposi sarcoma. The mean age at diagnosis um, was 37 years. Um, HIV associated um, Kaposi sarcoma typically presents in younger patients um, with some studies documenting um, less than the age of 45. It's also known that patients with the classic form of Kaposi sarcoma typically present mm -hmm. at a, an older age, um, usually above 65 years of age. Um, the presentation of HIV related Kaposi sarcoma usually occurs at CD4 counts um, of the low 350 cells. Um, in this study, a median CD4 count of 128 
um, was recorded. It occurs most commonly in our mucocutaneous sites. Um, however, virtually any other anatom anatomical site may be implicated. Um, and then just with regards to some of the, the staining that we can use to detect um, the HHV8 um, viral genome, um, these were applied to some of the biopsies um, and there was a very, very high proportion of these um, which were positive. Again, just um, proving the association between human herpes um, virus 8 and um, HIV infection in the, the development of Kaposi sarcoma. Um, these are figures that I obtained from the South African um, National Cancer Registry from 2019, just to kind of support um, what I've already mentioned before. So um, you can see I've highlighted Kaposi sarcoma, um, and this is the total number of um, histologically diagnosed Kaposi sarcoma in males in all population groups in 2019. And then just alongside, I've included the, the total number um, diagnosed amongst black males um, in that year. Um, the next slide shows the same information just with regards to the female population in 2019. And you can see here that um, even this kind of male female um, predominance is, is noted. With regards to some of the risk factors of um, Kaposi sarcoma, um, it's very important to um, acknowledge the impact of antiretroviral therapy. Um, and so there are quite a couple of factors at, um, at play here, um, but uh, typically the degree of immune um, compromise at the beginning of ART initiation may play a role. There are various things like unmasking of um, iris may also um, be implicated in the development of um, Kaposi sarcoma. Then as we know, um, Kaposi sarcoma has a viral etiology. And so concomitant human herpes virus 8 infection is strongly associated with the development of Kaposi sarcoma um, in HIV infected individuals. Um, corticosteroid therapy um, is associated with the development of Kaposi sarcoma um, and as well as exacerbation and progression of lesions that are already existing. Um, this is quite an important consideration in our setting um, because we use corticosteroids quite frequently in, our, in, this, pop, in this patient population. We use it for um, PCP, we use it for TBM, sometimes cryptococcal meningitis, um, immune thrombocytopenia, and so it's just important to keep in the back of the mind, our minds that this this might, um, you know, treat another condition, but also exacerbate um, or, you know, um, propagate the development of Kaposi sarcoma in these patients. And then, of course, other opportunistic infections are also associated with the exacerbation of pre-existing Kaposi sarcoma or the induction um, and development of Kaposi sarcoma. Um, this, uh, this study um, that was published in 2021 looked at the impact of our South African antiretroviral treatment program on the age standardized incident rate of Kaposi sarcoma between the years of um, 1999 and 2016. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, a national antiretroviral treatment program was implemented in South Africa in 2004. Um, and so an interrupted time series analysis was performed to assess the impact of this, the introduction of ARTs um, on the incidence of Kaposi sarcoma uh, among Black South Africans of all ages. Um, and the reason for um, the choice of this population group is that it's the, the large population group accessing healthcare in our public sector. Um, interestingly enough, ART coverage at the initiation of the, the program was less than 1%. Um, has, and has increased um, to more than 60% by 2018. And I'm sure it's even higher now with our more widespread um, access to ARTs. Um, and basically the, the, the results of the study showed that nine years following the introduction of the antiretroviral program, the predicted um, age standardized incidence rates were 58% lower for females and 50% lower for males, which is quite remarkable. Sorry, Dr. Miller, would you like to? Thing. Um, and then just yeah, with regards to, you know, we can expect, we can probably expect further decreases in HIV related malignancies um, as access to ART earlier on in the disease um, uh, stages uh, becomes accessible and this might be explored in further studies as more data becomes available. Just going to move on to the clinical presentation of Kaposi sarcoma. So it may, as I mentioned earlier, it may involve a wide variety of anatomical sites, 
but cutaneous disease occurs mm -hmm. most frequently and is the typical initial presentation of Kaposi sarcoma. So um, we'll just start with the cutaneous um, form of the disease then. So it is most commonly located on the, the lower extremities, um, face, particularly the nose, um, oral mucosa, and the genitalia. Uh, with regards to the characteristics of the lesions, they're typically elliptical lesions with a linear arrangement and often occur along the skin tension lines. Uh, the color of the, uh, the lesions are very variable. They may be pink, red, purple, brown, and that depends on how um, vascular the lesions are. Uh, the lesions are typically papular um, and range in size from about seven millimeters to um, seven, several centimeters in diameter. Um, the distribution may be symmetrical, it may not. Um, they are typically non-tender and non-pyritic and don't typically result in necrosis of the under, overlying or underlying um, tissue. Um, and they may be associated with lymphedema um, in the face, in the genitalia, lower extremities. And when this is present, it is thought to, um, to be associated with vascular obstruction mm -hmm. by lymph adenopathy, as well as um, the role that cytokines play um, in Kaposi sarcoma. And as the disease progresses, lesions often evolve. So they may first be noted as patches, then they may become plaques, and then they may become um, nodular in nature. Um, it's also just worth noting that because the, the appearance of these lesions are so variable, um, we may incorrectly um, diagnose um, Kaposi sarcoma um, and mistake them as for other lesions, which are not Kaposi sarcoma. So I've just included these over here. It's just important to keep in the back of our mind when we are assessing patients with suspicious skin lesions. Um, with regards to uh, visceral Kaposi sarcoma, the most frequent sites include the oral cavity, gastrointestinal tract, and respiratory symptom. So with regards to the oral cavity, um, the most affected site is the palate um, and then the gingiva. And these lesions um, are easily traumatized with chewing and may um, result in pain, ulceration, bleeding, or secondary infection. Um, and with advanced lesions, um, they may actually hinder nutrition and, and speech um, in, a, in a population group that might already be um, at a high risk for malnutrition. With regards to gastrointestinal tract involvement, um, this may occur in the absence of cutaneous um, Kaposi sarcoma. Um, it's implicated in approximately 40% of patients at initial presentation, um, but this was, this was noted prior to the, the use of combined um, antiretroviral therapy. Uh, these patients may be symptomatic or they may experience um, a wide array of quite nonspecific um, symptoms, such as loss of weight, abdominal pain, um, nausea, vomiting, upper and lower GI bleeding, malabsorption, intestinal obstruction, or diarrhea. Thank you. Um, so with regards to respiratory symptom, system involvement, um, pulmonary involvement usually occurs in conjunction with more extensive mucocutaneous disease um, in about 80 to 90% of cases. And it's, it's quite rarely the initial kind of presentation of a Kaposi sarcoma. The symptoms again here are, are quite nonspecific. They may include shortness of breath, fever, cough, hemoptysis, or chest pain. And there's, there's quite a broad differential um, of other respiratory conditions that may be seen um, in HIV positive patients um, that also present with this kind of um, complex of symptoms. They may be asymptomatic um, and may just have incidental radiographic findings. Some of the findings that we might um, find on chest x-ray include nodular or interstitial or even alveolar infiltrates. Um, there may be pleural fusion. We could see hilar or mediastinal um, adenopathy, or we might just see an isolated nodule. All right, and then just um, with regards to kind of you know, the diagnosis of Kaposi sarcoma, often with our cutaneous um, Kaposi sarcoma lesions, we very frequently make a presumptive diagnosis based on the, you know, the characteristic appearance of the lesions. Ideally, we would like to perform biopsy um, and confirm, um, you know, these lesions. That's not always the case in our setting. Um, and um, it can also be confirmed with immunohistochemical staining using endothelial markers. And then, although no current guidelines recommend the use of um, biological diagnostic tools to detect the human herpes um, virus 8 
genome or antibodies, um, we, we can detect them using latency associated nuclear antigen um, histochemistry staining or PCR. And it's probably more for in the academic kind of research realm. With regards to our diagnosis of our visceral forms of Kaposi sarcoma, um, lesions within the oral cavity can be confirmed by biopsy. biopsy. Um, within the gastrointestinal tract, um, if we suspect that a patient might, may have upper or lower GI bleed, we can submit a stool specimen um, to test for occult blood. We can further perform endoscopy for patients who test positive for occult blood um, in the stool or those who have um, GIT symptoms. Um, at biopsy, um, uh, Kaposi sarcoma may be recognized as confluent or isolated um, hemorrhagic nodules and may occur at any length of the GIT um, and then ideally would be confirmed by a biopsy. And you can just see it. Um, here's a picture depicting some lesions in the gastric mucosa and in the oral cavity um, of patients. With regards to um, diagnosis of respiratory system involvement, um, though not routinely performed um, in our setting, we, we can um, perform a CT chest to, to further evaluate um, and describe abnormalities that might be noted on the chest x-ray, or um, in individuals who, who might have suspected um, respiratory involvement with a normal chest x-ray. Um, at bronchoscopy, um, we may visualize the characteristic kind of cherry red or violaceous macules or papules, and we can perform biopsy and confirm the diagnosis of Kaposi sarcoma in these lesions. Um, with regards to the use of pleural fluid cytology and pleural biopsy, um, there's not really much of a, a role for this um, in the diagnosis of Kaposi sarcoma per se, but it has been described that it could be quite useful um, for the exclusion of of concomitant infection or other causes of a malignant effusion, for example, lung carcinoma or non-Hodgkin lymphomas. All right. And then the stage, the most commonly employed um, staging system for HIV associated related, excuse me, um, Kaposi sarcoma was developed by the AIDS clinical trial group um, of the National Institute of Health. And um, this looks at uh, the, the extent of the tumor the patient's immune status and um, the presence of systemic illness. And we kind of stratify these patients based on good prognostic factors versus poor prognostic factors. And so patients with disease that is limited to the skin or has very minimal involvement of the, the oral cavity, those with CD4 counts that exceed 200, um, and patients without a history of other opportunistic infections, um, without the, you know, the, the classic constitutional symptoms or B symptoms, often quoted in the literature, or other HIV-related um, illnesses, they typically have better prognostic factors. And then those with um, you know, more extensive um, tumor burdens, so um, lymphedema and ulceration, um, extensive oral cavity involvement and other visceral disease, um, in the context of low CD4 counts have poor um, prognostic factors. Um, with regards to um, considering treatment mod modalities in these patients, uh, this is often um, dictated by the absence or presence um, of the symptoms resulting from oral lesions, um, gastrointestinal tract involvement and pulmonary involvement. And um, these play quite an important role in um, our treatment decisions. So the goals of treatment um, in this, you know, kind of the treatment is um, symptom relief, um, prevention of disease progression, um, as well as tumor shrinkage to not only alleviate edema and prevent further organ compromise, but also to alleviate the psychological stress that might be associated with extensive um, lesions. Um, so antiretroviral therapy remains the mainstay of therapy for patients with HIV-related Kaposi sarcoma. And um, antiretroviral therapy alone is actually the only, indi in, only therapy indicated in the absence of specific indications for chemotherapy. Uh, the use of um, antiretroviral therapy is associated with a significant reduction in the incidence, as well as severity of newly diagnosed Kaposi sarcoma in HIV-infected patients. Um, HIV um, uh, replication is inhibited by antiretroviral therapy, and this reduces the production of um, HIV regulatory proteins, um, which <laughs> enable transcription, and this ameliorates the immune response to HHV8. 
So in some cases, there may be a need for adjuncts to therapy um, where ART might not be sufficient. And so um, local system, systematic excuse me, therapy exists. Uh, this is beneficial for cosmesis or for the reduction of symptomatic and bulky lesions. It is just important to kind of note that this doesn't prevent the development of new lesions, and that's quite important for, for counseling with your patients um, regarding these um, possible approaches to treatment. Um, there are various uh, local treatment approaches um, that exist, and these include um, intralesional chemotherapy, which re induces regression of, of tumors injected with um, chemotherapy um, agents. Um, in our setting, we use uh, vincristine and bleomycin. This is typically used for um, patients who have less than 10 lesions. Um, and it's also just important to note that it, it may be painful and it may result in, in scarring. Um, we also have access to radiation therapy, um, which is used to treat um, local disease, which might not be um, you know, responsive to, to intralesional therapy or disease that doesn't quite um, meet the criteria for systemic chemotherapy. Um, various topical um, agents have been um, uh, dis discussed and described to often use retinoic um, acids. Um, then in some cases, surgical excision may be considered for an isolated lesion, um, though there are seldom isolated lesions um, in our kind of um, patient population. And for smaller lesions, um, cryotherapy and laser therapy may be um, uh, opted for in order to control these lesions. With regards to systemic therapy, um, both antiretroviral therapy as well as systemic chemotherapy um, are recommended for patients who have advanced or rapidly progressive Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, there have been some small randomized controlled trials um, that have evaluated the role of chemotherapy um, as well as antiretroviral therapy versus the use of antiretroviral therapy alone. And um, while response rates have been shown to be higher um, with the addition of chemotherapy to antiretroviral therapy, no um, significant survival benefit has been demonstrated. And so we reserve systemic chemotherapy um, in combination with antiretroviral therapy in the presence of specific indications. And the indications for combining ART with systemic chemotherapy are noted here. So extensive cutaneous disease, so more than 25 lesions, uh, painful or ulcerated lesions, um, extensive um, cutaneous Kaposi lesions that are unresponsive to local treatment modalities, um, extensive edema, symptomatic visceral involvement, progression of Kaposi sarcoma on antiretroviral therapy alone, rapidly progressive disease, um, and patients who have iris-associated um, Kaposi sarcoma. Um, just for <coughs> some further considerations um, regarding um, systemic chemotherapy. So, um, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin um, actually regarded the gold standard of care. Um, Oh, sorry about that. Right, sorry, um, just been... No, it's okay. Um, so, so these agents are known to have a longer plasma half life um, than non liposomal formulations. Um, they are they're thought to be less toxic um, in the non target organs than conventional um, non liposomal um, formulations, and they provide a higher tumor concentration of the drug. Um, we we also um, use non liposomal agents such as paclitaxel, biomycin. Christine and etoposide, and these have, have been shown um, in studies to have comparable response rates, um, progression-free survival intervals, and um, you know two-year survival rates. Um, in our setting, uh, we where it's it's you know often considered a resource-limited setting, um, liposomal anthracyclines might not always be readily available. Uh, and so in these cases, paclitaxel, in addition to ART, is the preferred um, systemic agent um, and has been shown to have um, better outcomes than other regimens, such as the oral etoposide or the use of bleomycin in conjunction with vincristine. Um, 
as far as I understand, I think I don't think that we use Paclitaxel um, in our setting um, on account of its high cost. Um, so we do still use um, Vincristine in addition to Bleomine. <laughs> Right, we were just muting, we're continuing. And then um, further experimental approaches um, that aren't really um, particularly common in our setting, mm -hmm. but more in the research kind of realm or um, in um, first world country include um, anti-human herpes virus 8 therapy, imitinib, um, inhibitors of the mTOR pathway um, and various angiogenesis um, inhibitors. So these pictures um, I included in the slideshow just to um, kind of show the, the impact that systemic chemotherapy may have on lesions. Um, these are taken um, the patient on presentation mm -hmm. and then um, the ones below were taken after one round of, of chemotherapy. So it's quite remarkable um, how much these lesions can improve. Um, and then as um, I come to you know the end of my presentation, it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be right to exclude um, immune with constitution inflammatory sy syndrome associated Carposi sarcoma. Um, this results from restoration of a dysregulated immune response following antiretroviral therapy initiation, resumption, or even optimization, um, often leading to an exaggerated inflammatory and proliferative response against persistent pathogen specific um, antigens. Um, it's important to note that this isn't limited to patients with a high degree of immune compromise. And we um, recognize two distinct patterns. So you get the unmasking um, uh, Kaposi sarcoma iris, which is a new onset of presentation of the lesion. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to just mute. I do, but sometimes when people <laughs> log in, the, they're on. Okay. Somebody's muted. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dr. Muller. Um, and then you also get um, your paradoxical um, Kaposi sarcoma iris, which is the sudden progression of pre existing Kaposi sarcoma or the recurrence of um, lesions that were previously treated. Um, and this often presents as inflammation and enlargement of existing lesions with some interlesional swelling, increased tenderness, um, peripheral edema, or <laughs> worsening edema. Um, and it may, it's actually worth kind of noting that it may actually extend and appear at new anatomical sites. Um, with regards to Acoposis sarcoma iris, um, it usually occurs within the first few days um, or within six months after the initiation or resumption um, of antiretroviral therapy with the greatest risk occurring within the first two months. Um, typically, unmasking sarcoma iris occurs um, excuse me, later than paradoxical iris. Um, and it's just important to note that Kaposi sarcoma iris is associated with significant morbidity and mortality and thrombocytopenia. And these are just some of the, the factors um, in the literature that are associated with an inc increased risk of um, Kaposi sarcoma associated iris. So higher pretreatment um, viral loads, lower pretreatment CD4 counts, um, higher Kaposi sarcoma disease burden, so your, your T1 disease, if we, we consider the staging classification, um, use of antiretroviral therapy without concomitant um, chemotherapy, and then just detectable pretreatment um, plasma Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. Um, there is a bit of a controversy regarding the role of the use of adjunctive chemotherapy for the reduction of the risk of um, Kaposi sarcoma associated iris. Um, various studies have been um, performed um, with variable results. So some studies um, have revealed positive outcomes um, with um, the use of chemotherapy in conjunction to ART for the reduction of the risk of um, Kaposi sarcoma um, iris. Others have not just demonstrated this risk. And so I suppose we'll probably have to wait for, for more data to become available. Um, but just with regards to principles of management of Kaposi sarcoma iris, um, it does not imply failure of antiretroviral therapy or necessitate cessation or modification of the ART regimen. 
Um, in these cases, um, systemic chemotherapy in conjunction with antiretroviral therapy is recommended. And once again, it's important just to, to remember that glucocorticosteroid um, therapy is contraindication, contraindicated, excuse me, um, in these patients, given the potential for life-threatening exacerbations. Um, and then just back to, to Mrs. TN, um, we didn't forget about her. Um, in this case, um, it's clear that she um, had um, biological, immunological, and clinical um, failure, um, and was erroneously diagnosed with pulmonary TB um, on chest x-ray findings. Um, and so appropriate management for, for this patient would be firstly to, to stop the TB treatment. Um, we would like to refer her uh, appropriately to um, internal medicine um, for further referral to oncology for systemic um, chemotherapy. She needs to be changed to regimen two um, of antiretroviral therapy. Um, and because of her low CD4 count, it would be worth recommencing her on Bactrim prophylaxis until her CD4 count exceeds 200. With regards to, to further monitoring for Mrs. TN, um, she is going to require um, monitoring of FBC with differentials and repeat viral load um, in three months on account of the change of her ART regimen. She's also going to um, benefit from a repeat CD4 count in six months. Um, and then because we don't only care about the, you know, the, the biological aspects of, of patient care, we also need to consider psychological and social factors that may be um, limiting her um, ability to adhere to her medication or um, just you know, get better. Um, so it's important to involve a social worker, um, dietitian, um, should a nutritional uh, assessment reveal that it's indicated, um, and then um, introduction of you know, screening for other um, malignancies that are, at, that are um, very prevalent in HIV positive patients, such as pap smear screening tool. So just in conclusion, um, following the introduction of combined antiretroviral therapy, the incidence of Kaposi sarcoma has declined significantly. Um, early diagnosis, treatment, and appropriate referral of Kaposi sarcoma is essential. Um, and then ongoing HIV counseling and testing, linkage to care, and viral suppression also plays a very, very important role. And I think this actually underpins uh, the the prevention and management of Kaposi sarcoma. Um, and that is something that we can, we can focus on in primary healthcare. We may not have access to chemotherapy, um, chemotherapy but we can um, make sure that we, we take care of our patients that present to our clinic with HIV infection um, and prevent you know, um, HIV-related malignancies. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Lemley. That was an excellent presentation. And keep in mind, um, as one of our interns, she was allocated this topic at the beginning of the month before she knew she was going to be speaking to 120 people plus. So we had a full 100 people on the Zoom call, uh, which means um, some people might even have been cut out because we only have place for a maximum of 100. In the future, we can also live broadcast on YouTube. Uh, but this will also be recorded and will be available on the WUSU YouTube um, site. So thank you very much, Dr. Lindley. I'm going to be managing the discussion side of it because we're managing both online participants. And here in the Family Medicine Boardroom, we also have uh, our full complement of doctors and registrars and consultants. Um, what I would recommend is please, um, I just want to close this here please put in the put your hands up if you would like to ask a question um, so that we can just start looking whether there's any questions about the presentations or comments or uh, things that you have noticed from your own practice um, and just a reminder for those of you that's joined a bit later if you if you scroll to the top of the chat there's a google form to fill in for the attendance register even if you've pre-registered you still need to fill in the attendance register to show that you've attended this session um, can I start here in the group to see if there are any questions or comments here from the family medicine boardroom, and then we'll go to the to the Zoom group. Uh, 
Um, yes, Dr. Yusimi, and just please introduce yourself um, before you start to speak. Yes, I'm Dr. Yusimi Ordafuentes. I'm working here at the ARB unit at the CMH. So thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive approach to this medical condition that can affect the people living with the virus, okay? As you know, the uh, Kaposi sarcoma has a variable clinical cause. So can be from minimal disease that you can diagnose by incidental findings to the most severity of the disease with disseminated Kaposi sarcoma. The majority of us focus on the physical symptoms, but we cannot forget about the psychological component of the disease, especially in females, when you have a disseminated cutaneous, I mean, the classic Kaposi sarcoma, because many people feel rejected, okay? <laughs> people also feel less attractive, and we need to do the screening for depression in this type of population, okay? So remember also that the uh, human empress virus 8 is not only linked to Kaposi sarcoma, it's also to the non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the Castleman disease, okay? Um, the controversial issue of steroid has been there for a long time. So remember uh, that we need to see and putting a balance in the scales, the benefits and the risks and the team will decide what is the best thing. But the bottom line here is that the gold standard treatment is the ARBs for the patient. And if we come back to the case, you can see how this patient has been failing for a long time, keep it on the same regimen, and the patient has all of the symptoms of biological failure, immunological and clinical, and no action was taken with that. I know that uh, some of the colleagues working in a very rural setting area that they don't have access to the physicians and another a, a, a experienced doctor working in the setting. So please don't delay to send the patient or make a phone call to try to discuss when they are not winning the battle, okay? Because this patient has been persistent at TT4 TV for five and a half months and with a very poor response, okay? So I'm going to stop here in case that somebody else can say some comments. Thank you very much. Just please introduce when you start. Hi there, thanks, it's Pierre André Mann speaking. Dr. Lemley, great talk, thanks so much. Um, so I'm just making some comments from my experience in the district hospitals with Carposi sarcoma. I think that, you know, it's all good and well saying patients must take their ARVs and it's going to get better, but then oftentimes you're stuck with this patient suffering and with lots of topical lesions or lymphedema and managing it. So there's a couple of hacks that we had. So one of the things, um, this was for OR Tambo, I'm not sure if it's the same in BCM, but for wart treatment, they procured Aldara, which is Imiquimod, which is um, widely available. And that actually is also something you can use for isolated topical lesions, which may also help as Dr. Yusimi said, for isolated facial lesions, et cetera, to just reduce its size. And there are some articles um, citing its use. Um, the other thing which we did a lot of, we had a very proactive um, therapy department is we did serial compression bandages on peripheral lymphedema, and we actually taught the patients how to do it themselves. So they do twice daily compression bandages with readily local available bandaging. Um, there was also a study in Kenya called the KICS trial where they actually was doing this. And it's about helping patients to self-manage their lymphedema. Of course, if it's not the aesthetic or the generalized um, uh, clinical state that is poor, the lymphedema can be very functioning limiting. Um, and then the other, other thing is that if you are in the district and you have a suspicion of this to know that you need to do the biopsy, you need to do the chest x-ray and you need to do the fecal occult blood before your referral, just so that the patient doesn't have to travel up and down, up and down when they do go to the specialist center and they need to get further testing done before they can be staged. Thanks so much for a great talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Manz. Yeah, thanks very much for an excellent presentation. As you can see, the efforts uh, your team actually puts into uh, the presentation. Um, the focus for, for me is on the case and less of the Kaposi sarcoma because our focus now with the easy access to antiretroviral therapy, coupled with the mm -hmm. fact that we have implemented test and treat, the focus for clinicians now is to treat to targets, to achieve virological suppression and compliance to uh, uh, the guideline. 
patients was deemed to, you know, this patient actually started failing from 2019, just before, uh, before the onset of COVID epidemic. And the patient needed uh, viral load to be repeated to, to uh, three months. Uh, that should be September of 2019. But we kept repeating the viral load every year till 2019, uh, till 2021, uh, 2022, actually. That is where the problem is. Because these patients, we will add every opportunity to have prevented these Kaposi sarcoma in this patient. If somebody had acted on the viral load that we are seeing here, perhaps maybe we are the managers, especially our uh, boss, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Jackter, we need to be looking at uh, making uh, accessible NHLS database to all the, to actually every nook and crannies of the clinics in the, in the province. So that before somebody pulls the blood of patient for another viral load, they need to be able to check the results that have been previously obtained so that we can save money. You know, we are wasting money repeating viral load every time in patient that needed to have been switched before the onset of this Kaposi sarcoma. And I think that is a great lesson for all our clinicians working outside the peripheries, uh, periphery of uh, regional hospital to, to pay attention to. The, for suspicious lesions, mm -hmm. it's important, especially for communities, uh, our team working in CHCs and uh, district hospitals, you need to be able to up refer these patients. The excision biopsy for clinically suspicious lesions, because one, bacillary angiomatosis, uh, bacillary angiomatosis is readily treatable with erythromycin or even docicycline for a course of three months, you know, and that needs to be quickly excluded. Uh, you know, in these patients. But more importantly, I, I think it's, it's important for us to cover the basics. Uh, a study that was conducted here in BCM by a colleague of mine uh, in 2019 actually showed that about 60% of our patients are still presenting late. So in addition to patients failing their regimen or patients defaulting on treatment who may end up developing stage three, stage four diseases, Though they are still, you know, patients, especially males, are presenting very late for, you know, in terms of diagnosis. So those patients may come ab initio with Kaposi sarcoma. But I think these are the key areas that needs attention. And I think as we as we begin to, uh, you know, start this, um, you know, monthly or weekly tra training, we'll be able to, you know, catch up and improve clinical skills across the province. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Uh, no, I've not seen any. No, okay. the chat is just, I mean, there's no hands up at the moment. Oh, okay. there's one hand up. Dr. Jaka, I'll give Dr. Stephen and then I'll ask Dr. Jaka to comment. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for a great presentation and uh, great to see so many people joining joining on the on the Zoom chat. And um, just a few comments from, so I'm uh, David Stead, Infectious Diseases uh, at CMH and Freer. Um, and so obviously we've seen it, you know, see a lot of KS cases. And and I think um, your case presented, like many of them do that they get, especially with pulmonary case, they get misdiagnosed as TB. And um, this, this does tend to be a misdiagnosis case in general. And especially with that not presenting with cutaneous lesions. And, and it's worth noting that some KS will present with visceral disease before, or even with, in the absence of mucocutaneous. So, so key to examine your patients thoroughly, um, and, and you haven't examined any patient actually, but especially in HIV positive patient, if you haven't looked in their mouth with the light and the tongue depressor, so maybe one, one take home point, uh, you know, because you're going to pick up a whole bunch of things in the mouth, like oral candidiasis, oral hereolica plecha, you might go to stage your patient and KS, you know, picking up a case lesion in the mouth might completely change your assessment of a patient with a, with opacities on a chest x-ray and the respiratory symptoms. And they can have, I think, as you alluded to, they can have so-called B symptoms. They might have fever, uh, night sweats, you know, so they can easily tick the box for a, for a TB case. And I think we say, you know, uh, kind of attuned to diagnosing TB at primary care that unfortunately we, you know, we miss things that aren't, that can mimic TB and pulmonary case is definitely one of them. And it, you know, it might really be fatal to the patient if there's a delayed diagnosis. Pulmonary case carries quite a poor prognosis. Um, in, uh, yeah, in my experience, quite high mortality once there's extensive lung involvement. 
Um, so, so just key to examine your patients thoroughly, as well as looking extensively on the skin. Sometimes there's one lesion, you know, on a buttock. Or, so if you don't undress your patient, examine them thoroughly, you may you may miss the the, the clue to the diagnosis. And, and sometimes they can present with just edema as well. We've, I remember some cases with sort of idiopathic bilateral leg edema. They usually get, you know, Doppler ultrasounds, you exclude DVTs, the obvious causes, and then you scratch your head. So again, important to look, inguinal nodes might be a clue. And so sometimes the edema presents before the, before the purplish lesions were usually when the penny drops. Um, so, so those are important things to consider. I, th I think just considering the risks of steroids are important. And, uh, you know, we've done an, a number of trials of randomized control trials of, of steroids for different indications. Um, and the, the biggest one was for, for TB pericarditis, the MP trial, um, and uh, which was uh, over a thousand patients across Africa. And there, they, if, if you know the trial, they actually showed steroids for TB pericarditis were harmful in the HIV subgroup because of excess malignancies. And those were largely Kaposi's. Um, so, so it is, you know, if we're using, there are indications for steroids in HIV, like PCP, as you mentioned, but always just examine your patient, make sure they don't have Kaposi's. So, so you may want to reconsider your steroids if you, we've occasionally seen genuine PCP and Kaposi's, and we've had to think quite hard about the risk benefits of the use of steroids. They, I, I have seen a fatal case of, <clears throat> of KS after that was sort of unmasked with high dose steroids. Um, so it can really be, you know, very florid and very rapid. So, so it's worth it's worth just thinking about um, when using steroids, steroids in HIV. In terms of, so, so the challenge is these patients, the, the classic is a bit like your one, we admit them hypoxic, they've been diagnosed with TB, they've got a, you know, they've got KS and they've got this pulmonary, uh, pulmonary changes. And then the challenge is, you know, you want to urgently start ALVs, you want to urgently start chemo, uh, but, but now they've been newly diagnosed as TB or have they got TB? So you want to try and rapidly work them up for TB. Sometimes we treat for both, if we, we, we're not, and, and it's possible they might have both, um, but you want to try and, you know, get your ALVs and your chemo in urgently. We do initiate chemos in patients. Um, so we use vincristine and bleomycin at CMH. At free oncology, they do use adriamycin as a third agent, I think in the more severe cases. So, so practically, um, you know, we, we do treat some patients as outpatients through the medicine department at CMH, which I think is quite... <laughs> Quite unusual. We don't have capacity for a large number of, of patients, so so it's, I think worth discussing with us if they can access uh, freer, then that's usually more practical. And um, those are just some comments from myself. Yeah. Thank you very Thanks. much, um, Dr. Jata. Next, and then Dr. Kruger. If you come to the front, so long, and then Dr. Kaswa. Um, Dr. Jata, yeah, you can unmute to speak. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Madeline. Uh, I just raised up my hand. I thought you said you were going to ask us at the end. It's fine. Uh, mine is to start with thanking the presenter for such a, an extensive presentation, which starts at primary care, showing the primary care teams that are here, when and how we miss patients and what should we have done at primary level. I think I'm covered by the previous two speakers because I wanted the primary team to pick up the, their level of care that this patient had a suppressed viral load from 2017 to 2019 and somewhere in 2019, uh, we lost track of this patient. And this was us at primary health care or, or, or somewhere. I don't know where she, she was managed uh, from 2019 onwards. I don't know when she probably got to Frontier to be seen for, 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 for this Kaposi. And also I appreciate that you picked up a case that is outside BCM, which was my reason for us having these uh, uh, Zoom sessions. It is for those people in the periphery to actually be part of the discussion of their cases so that then Chris and district can see or Frontier Hospital can see where they actually miss the, this patient together with their PHC. And I hope uh, TBHIV care, the NGO that is supporting Chris and he is picking up this, that this is a virological failure since 2019, as, as Doc was saying earlier, and these are, are, are viral loads that were just taken, never interpreted, never actioned for, for, for quite a long time. And you can see the numbers on that screen as they were going up and nothing was done. And I'm saying to my PHC teams, colleagues, this is where we are missing patients. This is why our hospitals get full. It's when a viral load goes on for years or for months without us uh, doing anything. And 
all we we do is, is 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 link these patients to appropriate care. If you are a nurse at the clinic and you do not know what to do, refer the patients to the next level of care. And I mean, from uh, Queenstown, they have a hospital and uh, hospitals around them. They should be able to share these cases, and they have NGOs that have doctors who should be supporting these nurses. So colleagues, pick up pick up all these areas, or all these areas. And on the on the availability of results, doc, I think all clinicians have access to lab track. They should be able to get the results. However, one element that I will take up with my head office is, 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 uh, is data availability. I, I don't know if, if, if lab track uses data, I don't use it, but I've heard many people saying that, and also available, availability of the appropriate gadgets. However, I know primary health care teams that in your primary health care team clinics, I was told that, for the CCMDD program, you have uh, computers that have got data. So this should not be a problem. It should be a matter of us managers picking up uh, this case. And I also appreciate, I think Dr. Steed covered me because I was going to say for primary healthcare colleagues, this case is typically tells us we should actually examine patients properly. And my question was going to be on the stopping of TB treatment. I, I, I hear you now, Dr. Steed, uh, that they, they must have uh, uh, misdiagnosed the, the lesions of Kaposi, but I wanted to know from the presenter if it was a, a, a radiological diagnosis, there was no sputum taken, there was nothing else done for them to come to, to the diagnosis of TB and manage this case as a, as, as a TB case. And I appreciate your advice that now they understand why the, this patient must be switched to regimen two. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, thank you for your question, um, Doctor. So I presented the the Is it only me? We can't try this because it was our mistake. We thought we'd unmuted, but we hadn't. Dr. Lemley is just answering Dr. Jackpot's question. My apologies. Um, thank you for your question, Doctor. Um, so this patient was diagnosed with TB um, in December of 2021 on the basis of the, this chest x-ray that is projected on the screen. Um, so on her initial presentation in December, um, to I presume uh, the, the district hospital from which she was referred to us, um, a gene expert was performed um, and it was noted to be negative. Um, and then um, she had another gene expert um, performed in March. And she'd already received about four months of TB treatment at that stage. And that was also negative. So in this case, um, there was no kind of um, histological or um, um, that, yeah, there was no there was no lab um, diagnosis. It was purely based on the chest X-ray findings, um, which yeah, um, can't really mistake anyone for considering that TB could be an, an option, a possibility in this patient. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand to Dr. Kruger, who's been waiting very patiently. Hi everyone. Um, it's David Kruger. I'm one of the interns here at CMH. Thanks, Dr. Lemley, for the presentation. Um, I had a patient the other day who came in already with a diagnosis of Kaposi. He's a really large lesion inside the mouth, very difficult to access. So my main question is: I know the ideal is to do an excision biopsy, but are like is a punch biopsy an option for someone who you can't really excise the lesion for? Are you a before if you're in a district area like here? Obviously, we have access to specialists, but if you are somewhere far out, instead of sending the patient to a specialist facility to send them back and up and down and up and down, are there other means for a very large mm -hmm. lesion that you can't really excise as quite a junior doctor or yeah, so just a practical thing in terms of the lesions? I'll just try and say thanks. So, so you, you don't have to have histology for, for KS. So if it's typical KS, it, you know, it, it is acceptable to make a clinical diagnosis. It does have very distinctive features. I mean, it's important to note there are a few mimics and bacillary angiomatosis that uh, Dr. Adenay mentioned is probably, it wasn't on your list in HIV is probably one of the ones that can look most like KS. Um, but I think, I mean, the oral lesions are, are quite typical. 
I must say, I've never biopsied an oral lesion. Uh, just, just putting that out there. We have occasionally biopsied, very often it's oral and skin, and skin's easy to biopsy. You don't need to do an excision biopsy. You just need a, a piece of the lesion. So that could just be done with, you know, with a scalpel and some local anesthetic, just a, 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 the lesions are normally fairly, you know, uniform. And it's so anything that looks, and, and they all usually look fairly active. Um, but it, uh, it, it actually depends ultimately on whoever's going to be, if, if you're referring them for chemo, I mean, they all need ARV, so that's easy. You know, they all need urgent ART, milder disease, that might be all they need. For, for the more severe disease, as you mentioned, indications for chemo, that, that really depends on the, the oncologist, if they are comfortable with the, with the clinical diagnosis or whether they, if there's atypical features, then we do sometimes biopsy. So I think, I think with, you know, with the, uh, WhatsApp and uh, you know it's quite easy to send send a picture discuss with whoever you or whether it's free oncology or whether it's you know asset <laughs> medicine and uh, if you know it may not it may be that a that a biopsy is not necessary maybe the patient can just come on clinical grounds um, so I think maybe just get advice with with the referral hospital um, but if you've got a you know if, if you've got if you're able to biopsy uh, especially I think skin lesions are relatively easy um, that you can definitely go ahead and do that just be aware that they are quite they're quite vascular, so they can they can bleed you. Just have to apply pressure afterwards. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaswa. If you can unmute, um, I can see your hand up. Thank you, uh, Dr. Muller, and uh, nice presentation from the region. Now, I think most of the US speaker also highlighted. Uh, I would like also ask regarding the viral failure. It's mentioned starting from 2019, and because most of the Kaposi sarcoma we see in our practice as in early era of the ART, when we start, most of the time people come with advanced stage and then it was settled down. Since the COVID start, we see again the trend is starting. So my question is regarding, is there any impact of the COVID regarding the compliance or, or the access to the care that we lead to such kind of viral failure and was unnoticed from last two, three years, because we saw many collateral damage, especially in the chronic medication assess or the care. Is that could be also linked with this case? Then the, uh, yeah, the other question, small question regarding uh, the presenter mentioned about involvement of dietitian because BMI of the patient was very low, around 18 something. Is, that only the dietitian on the problem, or it is a systemic involvement of the Kaposi sarcoma that could might affect the GIT. So the oncology involvement might be more beneficiary unless the dietitian alone can do some work there. Otherwise, thanks, nice presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Kazwa. I'm just gonna repeat your comment because the sound wasn't 100%. And I think it is an interesting comment that this patient developed that Kaposi and is that biological failure? Was that purely just uh, resistance or was there actually an issue with her not accessing drugs during those years or intermittently yeah. accessing drugs? You mentioned the COVID might have disrupted her treatment and that maybe she, she wasn't actually taking treatment adequately. And that's partly also why she was failing and also led to the, to the Kaposi. So there's probably a multitude of factors that, that might have contributed to that. Um, and then in terms of the malnutrition, certainly in, in the CMH setting, we would have had access to a dietitian um, and that certainly in, in, providing extra nutrition would have been very beneficial. Of course, the malignancy in itself is probably the, the primary cause for why she was losing that much weight, as well as the HIV itself. Um, but very valid if one can involve your multidisciplinary team in these patients as much as possible, that's very important. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Prof. Adelekeke if you would please unmute. Um, I can see your hand is up, and I'm probably going to make that our last comment for today. Yeah, good morning, Dr. Mula. Uh, thanks. I think I'm covered. Um, I've been tuning in, and I think my point has been has been answered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are just oh yeah, we're ten past nine, so I think it is time to close this meeting. I would like to thank everybody who's joined. Thank you very much for Dr. Jatpa and the NGO for getting it all sorted. And a huge thanks for Dr. Lemley, who has um, initiated our program and has set a very high bar for the meetings from this side onward. If you can have a last clap for the presenter. 
Thank you very much. Um, enjoy your Fridays. Our next one will be in a month's time, again, broadcast from here, but there will be Friday meetings every Friday, and um, Dr. Jatla will keep you guys up to date in terms of the links for that. All the best and goodbye.